Welcome to the sixth annual Joseph Smith Lecture. I'm trying to see on my screen just how many have joined us. I think we have a quorum, we can start. I appreciate your attending tonight. I think you will be, I know you will be uh, greatly rewarded, but let me uh, formally start again with welcome to the sixth annual Joseph Smith Lecture on Religious Liberty with Senator Tim Kaine. We're honored by his acceptance of our invitation I am also very grateful to the Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy for co-hosting this event, and most especially to my colleague and co-host, Professor Jerry Warburg and the Batten event staff for making this possible. So there are two parts to our program. Senator Kane will of course address us. In addition, he has, however, very graciously and in these tempestuous times, very bravely agreed to answer our questions. We've solicited these questions both from our students in our respective departments, religious studies and the Batten School. And I will moderate them in about the last 20 minutes of our uh, meeting time. So I am now going to ask Dean Solomon, Dean of the School for Public Poli of Public Policy and uh, I'm sorry, Dean, <laughs> leadership and public policy. My mind is going to the next thing I wanna say, which is I've asked him for a particular reason. I think we appreciate a message better when we know the messenger. And I think also it takes one to know one. And so I've invited Dean Ian Solomon because he knows the Senator, but he also knows the work the Senator does because he himself is also experienced in public policy in a variety of areas and in leadership. So it's not just an honorary invitation. There was um, a, a sincere reason in asking him to introduce Senator Kane to us. So Dean Solomon, would you take over please? Thank you, Professor Flake, for that kind introduction and for the partnership that helped to bring this event together. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I know it's been a long day on Zoom for many of you, but you're back online for this special program this evening. So, so welcome. We're very pleased to be with you. Tonight, just two days after election day 2020 in America, while votes are still being dutifully counted in a handful of battleground states, while our democratic process is underway and the outcome of the presidential election is still uncertain, we will have an important discussion on a timely issue, democracy and religion. And who better to have this discussion with than Virginia's own US Senator, Senator Tim Kaine. Naturally, this is a time of anxiety and heightened tension for many people across the political spectrum. I know that I don't have any fingernails left at this point, but what better time to look toward enduring fundamental values compassion, service, humility, community, devotion, than during times of uncertainty. And as we navigate together through one of the most humbling years in our lifetimes with a devastating worldwide pandemic, frightening wildfires, an overdue national reckoning on racial injustice, a consequential and contentious election, it is a great honor to welcome a leader who reminds us that faith and religion can help to bring us together and unite us within this precious democracy of ours. Now, the last time I introduced Senator Kane before the Batten community and the UVA community, it was this past January in person, in Garrett Hall, on the UVA grounds for a conversation about war powers. It was a few weeks after the killing of Iranian Major General Soleimani. That was of course pre-COVID, pre-George Floyd, pre-election. Senator Kane's hard work on the issue of war powers over many years was rewarded as House and Senate passed his bipartisan war powers resolution, preventing further hostilities with Iran without congressional authorization. But Senator Kane brings a similar dedication and thoughtfulness to many issues, and especially to the issue of religious freedom. Before I turn it over to Senator Kane, I just want to say a few words about why I personally find him so inspirational. And this is from Professor Flake's invitation because I know his work and have studied it and have seen it up close. And it starts with his long record of service. 
the senator has helped people throughout his life as a, a missionary, a civil rights lawyer, a teacher, an elected official. After graduating from the University of Missouri, Senator Kane started his public service career by running a technical school founded by Jesuit missionaries in Honduras, empowering teenagers with skills to lift up themselves and their communities. And he's described those years as his North Star, which reinforced three core values that guide his personal and professional life, fe, familia y trabajo, faith, family, and work. And he puts in the work with dedication, passion, intelligence, collaboration. Senator Kane is one of only 30 people in American history to have served as a mayor, governor, and United States Senator. He currently serves on the Armed Services, Budget, Foreign Relations, and Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, the Health Committee. He is ranking member of Armed Services Readiness Subcommittee and the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Near East, South Asia, Central Asia, and Counterterrorism. I could go on with examples of his service and contributions, but I know you'd rather hear from him than from me. So today, as the 2020 Joseph Smith lecturer, Senator Kane will share some original ideas and reflections, and maybe some, some new and novel arguments about religious liberty and how it relates to our understanding of equality. Senator Kane, I thank you for your example, your humanity, your dedication to forge a more perfect and a more equal union. And I thank you for joining us tonight during what I'm sure has been and may continue yet to be a very busy week. Before <laughs> I turn to you, I wanna thank and recognize Professor Flake without whom this event would not be possible. Thank you for your leadership and partnership I also want to acknowledge um, the Batten staff that helped to put this event together, and also my Batten colleague, Professor Jerry Warburg, whose commitment to his students means that they get the good fortune to meet with Senator Kane on a regular basis. So without the ease of applause in this age of Zoom, I want to ask all of you online tonight to join me in welcoming Senator Kane to speak. Senator? Stay well, Dean, Dean Solomon and Professor Flake and Professor Warburg, I really appreciate the chance to visit with you tonight. Um, one of my favorite writers who is a writer, um, a novelist, short story writer and great spiritual essayist, the late Flannery O'Connor, uh, a phrase that's attributed to her is write to learn and learn from what you write. Um, you know, I think a lot of people feel like writers are writing what they know, but actually, uh, if you write something, even a speech, you're likely to think of something that you didn't know or hadn't contemplated before, either because you're deeply focused on a topic that you hadn't had the chance to think about, or you might have had a couple of thoughts in your mind that you hadn't connected before. Uh, Professor Flake reached out and asked if I would do the Joseph Smith uh, lecture on religious liberty um, today, and I was glad to do it. She had a wonderful suggestion about a direction that I might contemplate, which was sort of a, an analysis of, in our pluralistic society, where we have the state and we have individuals, the role of groups, churches, but also nonprofit and other organizations as sort of intermediators between the state and individual, and she asked whether, you know, de Tocqueville noticed that in the 1820s, is it still something that's powerful, uh, especially with respect to churches? It was a great suggestion, but when I sat down to write, I went a completely different direction in the way I want to tackle the religious liberty topic. So I particularly want to thank Professor Flake for the invite and for allowing me to ignore her suggestion. Um, and the one thing I do want to mention is I'm glad to, when I finish, take questions and answers on anything. You know, I'm going to talk about religious liberty in the First Amendment and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. You may want to ask me about what the Clark County Board of Elections is doing in Nevada, and I hope you'll feel free to talk to me about anything because it is a momentous time. So to begin, I'm very honored to address you tonight and offer the annual Joseph Smith Lecture on Religious Liberty. The Mormon Studies Program at the University of Virginia is very well regarded, and I have to admit to some puzzlement, um, as a Catholic to be asked to deliver this address. But I'm grateful nevertheless, because it forced me to turn off the television and actually ignore election news for a number of hours over the last days and weeks, which was probably beneficial to my mental health. 
The topic of religious liberty means a great deal to me. I was raised by very devoted Catholic parents, both still alive in their late 19, in their late 80s. And I chose public service as a life path following a year working with Jesuit missionaries in Honduras in 1980 and 81. I'm an active member of a diverse Richmond Catholic parish, and I participated throughout my public life in bipartisan spiritual reflection groups with fellow legislators, including Mormons like Jeff Flake, Mike Lee, Harry Reid, Tom Udall, and Mitt Romney, two of whom have been previous, um, uh, previous speakers at the Joseph Smith Lecture on Religious Liberty at UVA. Everything I do, I do for spiritual reasons. And I've now had a 26 year career in, in politics where I've never hesitated to discuss my own religious journey and how it motivates my work. I don't do that to proselytize, but I feel like it's important for my constituents to know what yardstick I use to measure and to calibrate my own actions. I think we in politics often discuss our policy positions but I believe that our motivations are every bit and maybe more important. Because I grew up in the Kansas City area, I first became familiar with Mormonism through our proximity to Independence, Missouri, which some of you know as the home of the reorganized Church of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Community of Christ. This church was a branch of Mormonism that split after a division over church leadership following the death of founder Joseph Smith, for whom this lecture series is named. As a family curious about other religious traditions, we visited Adam on the Amon, which is the historic site near Jameson, Missouri, that was proclaimed by Joseph Smith to be the place where Adam and Eve lived in exile after being cast out of the Garden of Eden. I'll admit that doctrines of Mormonism and the schisms within the church seemed weird to me until my theology classes and teachers at my Jesuit high school made plain that all religions have similar histories, divisions, petty skirmishes, bizarre doctrines, colorful charlatans, saintly people, acquiescence to powers that be rather than fidelity to principle. Let's face it, we're mortal and sinful beings. Efforts by mankind to understand and interpret the creator are beset by our own human frailties. These were demonstrated, this lesson was demonstrated so wisely by the Old Testament story of Israelites building a golden calf to worship while Moses was on the Mount receiving the 10 commandments. Traditional interpretations of the Exodus passage are pretty harsh uh, as Moses was in judging the weakness of those who built and prayed to the idol. But a more generous interpretation suggests something that's pretty understandable. The divine always has much about it that passeth human understanding. And human attempts to understand and interpret are natural and touching and sometimes comical. It's good that we're trying to understand and interpret, even though we're likely to fall short in our quest to know the unknowable. They can do whatever they want in cars. Right. If I could ask folks to did mute. I, did I say anything word. otherwise? Uh, what is what is plain about Mormonism okay. during this bicentennial year yeah. of its order is the tremendous suffering of its adherents at the hands of their neighbors and local, state, and federal officials. I mean, many of you probably know this history. State officials in both Missouri and Illinois basically waged war against Mormons and drove them into exile. And federal troops threatened the same against Mormons following their move to Utah, together with Jews throughout American history, Catholics during the 19th and early 20th centuries, and Muslims in the contemporary era, Mormons have faced unusual bigotry here. Joseph Smith stands as an archetype of the sad American history of religious persecution, murdered in 1844 while in jail for charges related to doctrinal disputes and thus considered a martyr for his faith. I will say for any lawyers or law professors on the call that Smith's murder was also like a law school exam in a First Amendment class because it also involved the destruction of a local newspaper 
and large and spirited public protests that were criticized as attempts at mob rule. Because Mormons have suffered for their faith in this land that proclaims a commitment to religious liberty, it's appropriate to consider that principle, the religious liberty principle, and how it's manifested itself throughout our history. And it's particularly fitting to do so here at the university founded by the author of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, which is the progenitor of the First Amendment that today protects the rights of all amendments to all Americans to worship as we please or not without being preferred or punished for the choices we make. Religious liberty. In the First Amendment contains two components. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Most legal scholars interpret these as separate clauses the first blocks any officially sanctioned state religion, and the second guarantees the right of every individual to worship as they please. Some view the twin phrases as actually a single clause, the promotion of individual religious freedom. The concept of religious liberty is linked in the First Amendment with other very important freedoms. Freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to peacefully assemble, freedom to petition government for redress of grievances, all of these freedoms are on display and being tested right now on the streets of this country. And the Supreme Court has also wisely, in my view, suggested that these combined freedoms also give persons the freedom to associate with whom they choose in both formal and informal groups and organizations. Taken together, the clauses of the First Amendment provide a powerful protection for people's rights to believe, speak, worship, publish, associate, gather, and seek the improvement of their society. They convey a strong enlightenment viewpoint that the lives of individuals, but also the life of society will be better if people can express themselves freely. In Jefferson's view, ideas vigorously and freely and confidently expressed and subject to public consideration will test each other and improve each other to the benefit of both individual understanding and social progress. Because of the structure of the First Amendment, indeed of the entire Bill of Rights, we tend to view religious liberty as a freedom concept. A person should be free to practice his or her chosen faith and shouldn't be burdened or rewarded by government as a consequence. Jefferson's famous wall of separation between church and state, which was something that he put into a letter that he wrote. Some people believe it's in the Constitution. It's not. It was in a letter that Jefferson wrote. That famous wall of separation conceives of religious liberty in this way as a freedom concept. The wall prohibits religious doctrine from warping public policy, but also stops governments from burdening the practices of believers. What I want to do is argue briefly that Religious liberty is, much, is as much an equality concept as a freedom concept. And that's why I've titled this paper that I'm delivering to you, Religious Liberty as Equality. The idea of Bill of Rights protections as about equality rather than solely about freedom occurred to me recently following the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. As I observed, as I'm sure many of you did, the confirmation hearing of her successor, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, I grappled with the differences between the judicial philosophies of these two women. Justice Barrett, along with the late Justice Scalia, claims to be an originalist. Now, an originalist applies constitutional texts to current cases and controversies, and if there's any uncertainty about the application, tries to understand and apply the text as it was generally understood at the time it was included in the Constitution, whenever it was included, the 1780s or the 1860s or 70s. We tried to divine what those words meant to the general public or to those wordsmiths who drafted them at the time and apply them as such. Justice Barrett advocates this as the preferred method of constitutional interpretation. Her colleague, Justice Thomas, who also agrees, has written that any interpretive method other than seeking to divine what the framers intended is just, quote, making things up. 
and he doesn't mean that as a compliment. Since we have the Department of Religious, Stud Religious Studies as one of the sponsors of tonight, I'll make a theological comment. I see originalism as the jurisprudential analog to a very particular Christian scriptural tradition, biblical inerrancy, the belief that every word and every clause and every text in the Bible is literally true and inerrant. And it may not be surprising that, that this judicial philosophy uh, has been chosen by Justice Barrett, who's deeply committed to an evangelical Catholic faith tradition. But now on to Justice Ginsburg. And Justice Ginsburg is a little harder to pin down because in a humble way, she never sort of proclaimed her adherence to a grand jurisprudential school. She was reticent about that. Remember that Justice Ginsburg was a civil rights practitioner. She patiently worked for decades to get the Supreme Court to recognize something that we would all think is like completely obvious that the 14th Amendment's guarantee that all persons would receive the equal protection of the laws applied to women. The clause was added in 1870. All persons are entitled to equal protection of the laws. But in early cases, the Supreme Court said, no, that's not about women, even though it's all persons. It wasn't until a case in 1971 that the United States Supreme Court found in a case where the brief was written by this pioneering young lawyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that, wait a minute, the guarantee of equal protection of laws to all persons actually applies to women. That was what Justice Ginsburg did for decades before she was on the court. She forced the court to realize that the guarantee of equality actually applied to women and could be used to strike down sex-based distinctions in the law, especially those that were arcane or unjustified. Justice Ginsburg gave a fascinating interview on her 80th birthday to a public radio station in New York City. And she offered this answer when she was asked a question that the, the um, interlocutor asked her about, quote, her work to change the constitution in the ways you did in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And here's what Justice Ginsburg said. I didn't change the constitution. The equality principle was there from the start. I was just an advocate for seeing its full realization. Where we started out, even the Declaration of Independence starts out all men are created equal. So I see my advocacy as part of an effort to make the equality principle everything the founders would have wanted it to be if they weren't held back by the society in which they lived and particularly the shame of slavery. That's a very different way of viewing the Constitution than the originalism expounded by Justice Barrett, because it's not about the historical meaning of a particular clause at the time it was drafted. It's about the full realization of the equality principle. I'll call it an equalitarian jurisprudence. And this viewpoint is not surprising from a justice who faced discrimination throughout her life, both because she was a woman and because she was Jewish. Justice Ginsburg explained it further in a very pivotal case well known to Virginians, United States versus Virginia, where she authored an opinion declaring that our Commonwealth could not offer a military focused public university education and then limit that opportunity to males only. In that case, in 1991, she wrote the majority opinion and here's what she said. A prime part of the history of our constitution is the story of the extension of constitutional rights and protections to people once ignored or excluded. Now that phrase must certainly resonate with any Mormon, but also with many, many groups of people all over this country and frankly, all over the world. It does not surprise me that an equalitarian philosophy was embraced by a justice who was committed to her Judaism as Justice Barrett is committed to her evangelical Catholicism. Justice Ginsburg once humbly described her work 
as attempting to, quote, repair tears in our society, a formulation that carries an echo of the well-known Jewish tradition of tikkun olam, Hebrew for, quote, repair of the world. While Justice Ginsburg's advocacy for was most known for cases impacting the equality guarantee contained in the 14th Amendment, her formulation of a constitutional philosophy rooted in efforts to achieve full realization of the equality principle goes much, much farther than the 14th Amendment. First Amendment cases, including the treatment of religious viewpoints, are often really equality cases because they test whether society will be even-handed in allowing people to believe, to speak, to publish, to gather, and to worship as they please. The Sixth Amendment right to counsel in criminal cases and the Seventh Amendment right to jury trial in civil cases both have powerful equality undertones with respect to whether all can have access to the courts regardless of wealth. Many other cases analyzing criminal procedures and sentencing under the Fourth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments become equality cases because they explore the persistence of racial or other biases in our criminal justice system. Even antitrust and consumer law cases are rife with equality questions, situations involving powerful interests trying to dominate consumers or dominate small businesses. An equalitarian approach to hard constitutional cases tries to understand the plain meaning of a constitutional text. And if there are multiple possible resolutions of a problem consistent with the text, the preferred outcome will be one that best advances the equality principle. While Justice Ginsburg never used the term equalitarian, I believe that term applies very well to what she patiently and successfully attempted during her career, both as an attorney and on the Supreme Court. So now let's get to religious liberty in the First Amendment and dig into that just for a few minutes as I conclude. In cases dealing with the religion clauses of the First Amendment, an equalitarian philosophy strives to put different faith and ethical viewpoints on equal footing. The Establishment Clause forbids the state from elevating one religion or set of spiritual beliefs over others. And the Free Exercise Clause forbids rules that allow some to worship as they choose while blocking others from doing so. The nation dividing debates over contraception and abortion, and they've been played out very significantly in the election cycle that has just completed, look very differently under an equalitarian lens. Not only are women equals who must be given the same respect as men in making reproductive health choices, but remember that abortion and contraception are issues where there is significant difference of opinion between different American faith and ethical traditions. To use American criminal law to enforce as state orthodoxy one viewpoint, in my view, runs the risk of violating the equality principle by penalizing other good faith, religious, spiritual, and ethical beliefs. Cases dealing with LGBTQ rights often present the clash of freedom-based and equality-based arguments over the scope of religious liberty protections. UVA law professor Douglas Laycock delivered your 2018 Joseph Smith lecture, and he dug into this topic, analyzing the United States Supreme Court's masterpiece cake shop case, in which the court found that a Colorado state agency's hostility to the religious beliefs of a bakery owner opposed to same-sex marriage called for reversal of the penalties that agency imposed on the owner. The key to the narrow opinion was the majority's finding that the agency's hostility violated the, quote, state's obligation of religious neutrality. Broader questions of how to accommodate the baker's religious beliefs with his customers' lawfully protected rights to equal treatment were left unaddressed, but it was clearly an analysis of a religious liberty case in the First Amendment that implicated deeply equality principles that you would normally think about as 14th Amendment principles, but that really must be part of any First Amendment analysis. 
And actually right now in the, in the days of COVID safety regulations, cases are cropping up in which churches challenge government restrictions on worship as a violation of religious liberty. I live in Richmond, but I have a little condo a mile away from my office on Capitol Hill and I walk to work every day. I walk past Capitol Hill Baptist Church on about 6th and A Street on Capitol Hill. Capitol Hill Baptist Church recently filed a lawsuit, Capitol Hill Baptist Church versus Bowser. And they filed the lawsuit to challenge COVID restrictions on the size and the manner of its religious services and argued that those restrictions violate religious liberty. This is a recently filed case. It hasn't been resolved. DC is defending its actions by arguing that it applies the same restrictions to other activities and not just commercial activities like gathering in a movie theater, but other activities, including those specifically protected by the First Amendment, such as peaceful assembly. <clears throat> the case is going to ultimately be resolved by analyzing and balancing the freedom concept, religious liberty as freedom advanced by the church, and the equality concept, religious liberty demands equality that's advanced by the local government. I don't wanna suggest that religious liberty <clears throat> is not a freedom concept. It is, of course, <clears throat> but I think it's not enough to say that Mormons or Jews or Catholics or Muslims should be free to worship as they choose. Saying that somebody should just be free to do what they choose is a tolerance argument. And you know, sadly, sometimes tolerance can be closely akin to indifference. I don't think we should be indifferent to the spiritual aspirations of the American populace. Looking at religious liberty as an equality concept links it to an affirmative good articulated by Jefferson and Lincoln, the founders of our two enduring political parties. We promised equality, and that promise is not simply confined to the 14th Amendment, but it has deep reach into the entire Bill of Rights, including the provisions of the First Amendment that protect religious liberty. Look, we began our country's journey with a moral North, North Star, the equality principle. We couldn't live by it. We were hypocrites, just as humans often are, but we embraced it nevertheless. We tragically adopted a constitution 11 years after the Declaration of Independence that not only failed to include equality, but actually enshrined inequality, the Fugitive Slave Clause, clause the Three-Fifths Clause, the prohibition of Congress outlawing the international slave trade for 20 years. We then lived through decades of unrest and eventually horrific bloodshed until President Lincoln rededicated the nation to equality at Gettysburg and then in the aftermath of the Civil War, we restored equality's place in the post-Civil War amendments to the Constitution. But that wasn't enough because we're imperfect. Because we're imperfect as individuals and as a nation, we repeatedly fall short of the equality promise that Justice Ginsburg believed was her animator and tell prophets like Reverend Martin Luther King or Susan B. Anthony or Thurgood Marshall or Evan Wolf Wolfson or Ruth Bader Ginsburg remind us what we've promised to ourselves and to our posterity. And this cycle of striving and then failing and then rededication will last as long as America lasts. It's not part of our story, it, it is our story. Our nation's on a journey and we orient by this moral North Star, the equality principle. Sometimes we're true, and we orient true, and sometimes we drift off course. Even when we're true, we find, like sailors, that we can never reach the North Star. But when we orient by it, we're less likely to err, and we're more likely to become more perfect. The history of Mormonism is not the history of a people wanting to simply worship free from restraint and thus be left alone. The Mormon faith and its adherents, a very rooted American faith, wanted to assume a place equal to those of other faith traditions in a pluralistic American society. 
Therefore, our commitment to religious liberty is inextricably linked to the equality principle articulated by the enormously farsighted and deeply flawed founder of this university nearly 250 years ago. And Professor Flake and Dean Solomon, I'm thrilled to be with you and I'm now glad to engage in dialogue with those who are participating this evening. Thank you, Senator Kane. There, there were, and I don't use this word lightly, there were many profound concepts and suggestions in that talk. I'm going to ask my uh, co-host and colleague, uh, Jerry Wahlberg, if he won't give us a minute uh, to think about that and, uh, and, and to better understand it before we move on to a variety of topics that are ahead of us through our questions. Jerry, you want to talk uh, Thank you, Professor Flake, and thank you, Senator Kane. We're really very grateful, uh, and it's, it's a, a tribute to your character that you're able to focus on such a thought-provoking um, and really stimulating topic for me personally, and I know for our audience members as well, uh, given that there are a couple of other things going on in our world. Um, I want to try to draw out just a little bit more uh, this fascinating exploration of the relationship between First Amendment freedoms and religious liberty. Uh, frankly, it's fundamental to my own uh, life's work as a son of a civil rights activist born in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it resonated deeply with me. Um, and I'm kind of gonna lob you a softball, but it has to do with the role of faith leaders and faith in our communities uh, in our very divided nation. Um, you mentioned to Kuhn alone, the idea of repairing the world. This is certainly a challenge um, that we will look to our faith leaders uh, and our religious leaders to in a major way. Um, where in our current divided politics, uh, I, I confess I have the TV on in the background, I see people yelling at each other and beating on windows, uh, I, I know it's a stressed time, but where in our current politics and our current community relations do you most see the promise of leaders of faith uh, helping us in our way forward as we try to repair the wounds in our national community? Um, Jerry, it's a really good question. And um, we, we need our religious leaders to do this. And, and throughout our history, it's often been religious leaders who have helped us do this. I think most specifically, as you mentioned, of the civil rights movement, where it was religious leaders, ecumenical, certainly, who were calling us to our better selves, reminding us of the equality promise that we made about ourselves. Religion, like anything, uh, can also be a source for division. I mean, you know, humans have been able to take anything and use it for good or bad. I mean, the the, the forbidden apple that you know in the in the book of Genesis we were not supposed to take was the apple from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So even at 500 BC, when that book was written, there was a human understanding that knowledge could be used for good or perverted for a bad purpose. And, and religious leaders, you know, are humans like the rest of us. They can help or they can hurt. But I think the, you know, what I've been thinking about recently is one is a, a prayer attributed to St. Francis, make me an instrument of your peace. We're a very divided nation right now. And, and you know, this, <clears throat> this election, I think, is going to work out very well for Joe Biden. So great, he'll be a Democratic president, but he's going to have a Republican Senate. You know, the American public has said, well, you guys have to figure out how to make divided government work. And I wish we'd have, I wish we would have a democratic Senate and we could still, it, it will be very difficult to do it, the runoffs in, in Georgia, but it's likely to be some division still in government between the executive and the legislative branch, the Senate uh, being likely in Republican majority. So we've got to figure out a way to make it work. And I think our, whether it's the St. Francis prayer or other religious leaders saying, you know, well, maybe maybe the, the ministers who were on the red side hoped it would all go their way, and maybe the ministers who were more on the blue side hoped it would all go our way. But guess what? There's still going to be roles for everybody, and we've got to make it work, and we have to figure out a way to do it. So I really hope, I think those of us in public life have to, Democrats and Republicans, stand up for this make me an instrument of your peace thought um, but we could be significantly helped in this if our religious leaders would do the same. There are societies, as you know, Jerry, where religious leaders are not the bridge builders that pull people together, that religious leaders actually 
most often and most commonly preach division between, you know, Muslims and, and Buddhists in Burma or, <clears throat> or Jews and, and Muslims in, in Israel or, or, or Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims in the broader Middle East. So what we need from our religious leaders right now is sort of a St. Francis um, approach to, to pull us together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Senator Kane. Uh, let's now turn to our uh, student questions. I'm going to ask uh, Monica Marciano, who is uh, in the Batten School's Accelerated Master's Program in Public Policy, to ask her question of, of the Senator. Hey, Monica. Hi, Senator Kane. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, my name is Monica, and I was actually your intern last summer, so it's great to hear from you again. I thought that was the case. <laughs> yes. Um, so my question that I have for you is about what role faith communities can play in advancing a more empathetic approach to immigration policy, particularly at the U.S.-Mexico border. And so I'm wondering how, given the migrant protection protocols and restrictions on asylum seekers coming into the country due to COVID-19, what role faith communities can try to play in helping Central Americans who might be requesting asylum? Uh, Monica, it's a great question. And it is a, the immigration topic is, you know, so sadly polarizing where one side talks about immigration as if it's all about crime. And, you know, on the Democratic side, we sort of talk about immigration as if it's about sort of the economy and economic opportunity it's like we're talking different languages. <clears throat> but I do think the faith communities, they, they've been enormously helpful. Our faith communities have been helpful in encouraging us to do comprehensive immigration reform. Um, evangelical communities that were strongly pro-Trump on many things spoke out strongly against the, the separation of children from their parents. A number of them did, uh, which, was, which helped the White House do a U-turn and back away from that. But in trying to now figure out what the right answer is, we're going to need our faith communities. I know that President Biden is going to want to do comprehensive immigration reform. And the, the, the need for religious communities to, to not just take a partisan side and say, hey, look, we have ideas about this, things like refugee and asylum status. I mean, look at the notion of refugees, exiles, and asylees. Go to the Old Testament. My father was a wandering Aramean who went into Egypt and sojourned there and grew into a nation great and powerful. We, we think about this refugee crisis as if it's some, some current you know, crisis. No, this is, has existed forever and it exists all over the world. And the notion of trying to treat the stranger in a strange land with compassion is you know, an elemental value of the Judeo-Christian and other faith traditions. So we need our religious leaders to kind of put that on the table and they can help us with that. Um, I have actually, uh, before the election, talked to a series of bipartisan colleagues and religious leaders about a trip to the border sometime between the election and the end of the year, kind of regardless of who's in. We got some work to do here. Can we go down there together? I've been, I've been once before, with, but with a Democratic colleague, and I want to go with some, some non-legislators and some legislators of both sides. But I think as, as a Vice President Biden now, you know, I think who, who will be our president wants to tackle this issue. It, it's not going to be just policymakers talking um, amongst ourselves. We've, we have to have our faith leaders looking at the broad scope of our human history and the role that exiles and refugees and the treatment of exiles and refugees have always played in our in our kind of measurement of ourselves and whether we're living up to who we said we are. Thank you. I'm now gonna ask Lydia McVeigh, who's a fourth year in political philosophy, policy and law and a Jefferson scholar to ask her question. Hi, Senator Kane. Thank you so much for being here tonight and it's an honor to meet you virtually. Thank you for your remarks and thank you to everyone who came before me for your thought provoking questions. So my question has to do with the Democratic Party specifically and the religious left, as obviously I've been seeing in recent years and in 
most recent days, the Democratic Party has to constantly consider and redefine its identity. And that includes which voters it caters to and which issues it chooses to champion. The Republican Party has been remarkably successful in terms of associating itself with the religious right, so much so that I would say being religious is now perceived as generally synonymous with being politically conservative. So yeah. I was wondering where you think the role for religion specifically exists in appeals to progressive voters and whether or how you think that religiosity could be part of the Democratic Party's identity moving forward. This is a very, this is a very hard question. Um, I'll tell you, I think that there, there's sort of two um, polar philosophies about religion and public life that tend to kind of line up with the parties. It's not an exact match, but they kind of do. On the Republican side, it's a, you know, a commitment to evangelicism and, and Christianity and a belief that we should also then legislate our beliefs as law. Um, Democrats more commonly fall into another camp. I, I know so many Democratic officials who are very religious, but they read the New Testament invocations against praying loudly in front of the temple or trying to show off. And so it's not just the Jeffersonian wall between church and state. It's there's really good scripture about not trying to pretend that you're a virtuous person or, or advertise your, your virtue, but you should try to do it like the widow giving the widows might without seeking, you know, um, you know, any attention for it. Those are kind of two polar positions. Keep it quiet or be a religious person and then legislate your religious principles as long. Well. You know, the, the way I've always tried to do it is is different. I just try to share with people what motivates me, and then they can use that to measure whether I'm a I'm true to my own motivations or not. I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. I'm not trying to proselytize anybody. But if I would tell people that I'm married and have a couple of kids and I like to backpack and I play the harmonica, well, why wouldn't I tell them what's most important in my life that I I do what I do out of a spiritual motivation? So I I don't suggest that the Democrats should have a kind of you know, we, we need to embrace a particular religious viewpoint or religiosity, but I do suggest Democrats, we, we do need to share with people what our motivations are. I think Democrats often share our policy positions, but we don't share our motivations. For me, it's religion. For others, it's like, well, this happened to me as a kid, and I don't want anybody to have to go through this. Or, you know, my husband was was killed in a violent gun crime, and I'm, a, I'm passionate about trying to promote gun safety. I, I, think, I think Democrats often give you the laundry list of the policy prescriptions without sharing, here's what's motivating me. And I think motivations are important to voters. And I actually think they're probably justifiably more important than policy positions. This is a campaign that just finished. We talked about a million issues. I guarantee that there will be an issue next year like coronavirus that nobody talked about. They didn't talk about that in 2016. And look what's dominating. Some issue will come up next year that nobody talked about during the campaign. But if you know what motivates somebody, you can generally kind of figure out how they would approach it. So I, I really believe, I mean, as a Democrat, I'm always going to you know, share my own faith background. And that puts me, I'm in a quirky spot because my church doesn't like that I'm pro Roe versus Wade, but the Democrats don't like that I'm pro Hyde Amendment. I view those two things as completely consistent and about 30% of Americans are pro-choice and pro-Hyde Amendment, but the Democrats are pro-choice and anti-Hyde Amendment and the Republicans are anti-choice and pro-Hyde Amendment. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of you know, explain who I am and what I believe, but I don't think the right strategy for Dems is to kind of embrace a religious point of view because we're so diverse. And that's a great thing about the Democratic Party. We're so diverse. But instead, if we're all committed to sharing what motivates us, whether it's a spiritual motivation or you know, something in our personal life that's made us want to help others, I think that's what Democrats need to do much better. Thank you. I'm now going to ask Max Pengen, who is a fourth year doctoral student in the Religious Studies Department to ask his question. Uh, thank you, Senator Kane, for a wonderful talk. Um, as, a, as a religious studies a religious studies student, I uh, particularly enjoyed the empathetic reading of the uh, golden calf worshippers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Thank I you. thought that was very sympathetic and uh, interesting. Um, I have a question that's similar to Lydia's um, uh, re uh, religious left question, but it's also, um, but, but having to do with progressive Catholics. We're yeah. living in an era when uh, conservative Catholics have written, risen to the top of American power. We spoke about Amy Coney Barrett, but we could also have spoken about the juris jurisprudential uh, theory of William Barr or the state right. of Mike Pompeo. And, and my question is, where does that leave progressive Catholics? And are they numerically significant enough to be spoken of as a voting block anymore? In a recent piece in, in Commonweal, E.J. Dion uh, wrote that today it is often non-Catholics who are more effectively circulating the teachings of Catholic social thought. And um, so given you know, the, this phenomenal rise of the Catholic right uh, in recent years, my question is, do progressive Catholics really even figure into the political calculus anymore? And do you expect this quasi eclipse of the Catholic left to shape the future of the American church and, and how? Um, what, a, what a great question. And, and I will say, um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of, I, I sort of feel like I'm a parish Catholic rather than a Roman Catholic. Um, my, my Catholic worship experience since 1980 has been with the poorest of the poor in Honduras and then returning to the United States with a sort of fascinating part of American Catholicism, which has been black Catholic. So I've, I've worshiped since 19, the early 1980s in African-American Catholic parishes. I grew up in a white suburban Catholic parish. And, and certainly the, the, um, the, the veneer of American Catholicism is white conservative Catholics in a, an overwhelmingly white and conservative Catholic hierarchy. But the Catholic church from the lay person standpoint <clears throat> is increasingly people of color, Latinos especially. Why, why is Catholicism growing in the United States? It's almost all immigrant growth. And, you know, even I, I <clears throat> was often, you know, kind of questioned after the 2016 race when I was on the ticket with Hillary about, oh, losing the Catholic vote. And I always say, well, yeah, we lost the white Catholic vote, but we didn't lose the African-American and Latino and Asian and Middle Eastern Catholic vote, not by a long shot. The Catholic Church is fundamentally, the American Catholic Church is fundamentally reorienting around a more diverse laity. The hierarchy doesn't yet get it and their policies often don't reflect it, but you know, the, the Catholic laity is increasingly a, um, is a minority laity. And, and, that is, and that's why you know, Catholics, the, even the conservative hierarchy is often really good on immigration reform issues because they look out and they see who's in the pews on Sunday. So I think the, um, the Catholic church is sort of known by its conservative hierarchy and then, and then burdened and weighed down with things like the priest sex abuse scandals. But that's the headline. The, the kind of uh, current right now in the Catholic church is, a, is kind of a you know, everyday people's church and increasingly a minority church. Um, and that's why you know, uh, the, the, the viewpoints of the laity are often at such odds with the viewpoints of the hierarchy. I don't know whether the hierarchy is going to change. I mean, I, you watch the furious backlash against Pope Francis, you know, saying something positive about civil unions and, and that, of course, gay people should be able to, you know, marry and have families. He didn't call it marriage. He called it civil unions. But then, the, you know, the, the Vatican has to correct and backtrack and say it was taken out of context, etc. That I'm sure that was Pope Francis's sincere beliefs. We're all created in the image of God. I mean, isn't that what's in Genesis? Well, if that's the case, then that's straight, gay. I mean, we're all created in the image of God. And here's here's a hope I have about Catholicism. And I don't know, Max, whether you're a Catholic or not, but we're we're not a church. We are not a biblically inerrant church. If you're a biblically inerrant church, the Old Testament says that the uh, sun goes around the earth 
And, and we penalized Galileo for preaching the opposite, but then Pope John Paul said the church was wrong and Galileo was right. We are a church that will embrace science. And the fact that the church will embrace science makes me believe that on issues of LGBTQ equality, not at the pace I would like, but the church is gonna get there on that. The church will probably get there on the ordination of women because we're not, we're not inerrant, we're not originalists, we are science-based and willing to, you know, kind of look at the arc of the story rather than a snapshot of, you know, when it was written and what did they mean then. Anyway, that's a complicated answer, but I guess bottom line is there's a hierarchy um, that's pretty conservative, but what's going on in the laity is, is, is quite different, and that will eventually move the, just, I just, by tectonic plate, you know, quantum physics, it's going to move the hierarchy into a different place. Thank you. It's, it's hard not to uh, comment on these questions because they are so good. They are great uh, questions. I'm gonna, I, I, I hope, I hope uh, this uh, gives you a sense of what great students we have here, though I know you've seen this before. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to questions we solicited from the audience and take a few liberties because we only have a few minutes left. Uh, one of our questions from Liz Player, a teacher at Hollywood Elementary School and president of the uh, Latter-day Saint Relief Society locally, asks, and I think this question arises after so many years of uh, America First. She says, how do you balance your role as an American senator with your role as a world citizen? How do you manage the tension between national self-interest and responsibility to other countries as neighbors? What a what a fantastic question! You know, I, I you know, senators we we're, we're we're elected from a state, so how do you balance your state's interest against a national interest, and how do you balance a national interest against a global interest? You know, to to talk about relig we're religious traditions. I'm a I'm a Christian. I believe in the priesthood of all believers. Jefferson didn't say that all Americans are created equal. He said all men. Now, obviously you know, was he using an English language convention and men was to mean men and women, or you could certainly look at a lot of Jefferson's writings and he was not a big promoter of women's equality. So maybe he was blind and, and was discounting women. And certainly he meant African-Americans, even though he couldn't live that way. But, but it was interesting that Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, what he was announcing were principles that were universal. They were not limited to Americans. When we amended the Constitution at the end of the Civil War to put in the 14th Amendment, if you go back and look at the text of the 14th Amendment, it's fascinating. It says in the 14th Amendment, all citizens will be entitled to the privileges and immunities of the states, but all persons are guaranteed the equal protection of the laws. They could have said all citizens are guaranteed the equal protection law. They said all persons are. And that, that equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment has often been applied to non-citizens, immigrant children in K-12 school systems, you know, people who are here who are trying to get asylum cases resolved. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an equalitarian. I mean, I, I, I came up with that, that phrase because Justice Ginsburg didn't use it for herself. I came up with it just because it, it is a synonym for egalitarian. It's just not used very much. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll use it to describe what I think Justice Ginsburg's philosophy was. But I, I, I'm, as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, I'm often looking at, at things and asking myself, well, is it good for us? Is it good for others? Some, some would say, you know, trade deals, they got to be good for American workers, even if they screw things up in other countries. Well, I tend to look at them a little bit differently. I, I will tend to look at a trade deal, for example, and say, okay, what's the effect on Americans going to be? But, but if a trade deal might raise the standard of living in the Honduran communities where I worked and get people out of grinding poverty and give them a, a ladder, however humble, to a, a better lifestyle, then I think that's an, that's an important value that we should embrace. So look, if I, if I, if we believe that the equality principle articulated by Jefferson that was then rededicated by Lincoln at Gettysburg is, is our North star, it wasn't limited to Americans. 
Thank you. Our remaining questions actually, I think, have been answered in the course of our conversation tonight. For example, Batten student Victoria Nelson asks whether anti discrimination race laws can serve as a pattern for remedying discrimination in religion. And I think that was the major, one of the major points of your talk. Uh, our remaining students ask for, possibly in a more personal level, um, how. Uh, you appeal to secular constituents, as one of the students put it. So let me yeah. just ask you, is there anything left unsaid tonight that um, we could impose upon you to talk a little bit more about? Well, I, I do think that that question about secular constituents is a really good one. You know, the last time that I was at UVA, the Department of Religion in Baton had me come and I think it was maybe September of 2018. And, and I just really talked about, okay, my faith life and then how I try to use it in politics. And, and you know, what, how do I follow it, but not impose it on others. And I had a couple of students come up to me after that talk, which was, I think, at Cabell Hall and said, I've just never heard anybody. I'm, I'm, a couple of students said, I'm not from a religious family. I'm not from a religious background. I've just not heard anybody talk about their religious life and the way they try to incorporate it into, I've just never heard anybody talk about it before. And that, I, I, I feel like that's sort of what we should do with each other, just to learn from each other. My, my general counsel when I was governor um, is a very dear friend who, and he's Jewish and his son, Jake Rubin is the Hillel rabbi at UVA. This is one of my very best friends. And we are always trading religious literature back and forth. I'll give him Christian stuff and he'll give me, you know, books about Judaism or we'll trade books about Buddhism back and forth. And I always say to Mark, hey, look, you know, your being such an observant Jew is going to help me be a better Catholic. And I hope if I'm a better Catholic, it may make you a, a better Jew. The point isn't I want him to be like me or I don't want a secular person to embrace what I believe. But Again, if I share my motivations and my reflections about the big, the big picture meaning of what we're doing with somebody, maybe that'll spark an idea or thought in them that will make them dig, dig deeper into their own traditions or ethical values and reach some conclusions or thoughts that they hadn't reached before. So I think the way as a religious person to communicate with folks who are in the more secular space is, again, not through, hey, here's who I am, be like me or believe what I believe. But it's, let me tell you why I do what I do. Now, these are the experiences I've had and here's why I do what I do. Now, what about you? What, what's, what's your motivator, you know? Cause I can learn something from you too. And if we share our motivations with each other I think it's it, the defensive walls don't go up of like, oh, you're different than me. I'm, you're trying to convince me to join your club or join your church or whatever. Just let's just share our motivations. Often you can find connections with people and the motivation level when it's hard to find a connection with them on the policy or political level. But if you find a connection on the motivation level, that might open up a door where you can then find some path that could lead you to a common point on a political or policy point. So that, that's, I think, what we should do in politics is share our motivations and then learn from others' motivations to become better and, and hopefully make others better too. Thank you. Unfortunately, Zoom is not a medium that is conducive to a standing ovation. <laughs> but if it were, you would certainly be hearing one now. I, I cannot thank you enough. I'll repeat my thanks to the Batten School. But let me say in particular, since you began this way, that you were surprised to be invited. I have wanted to extend this invitation to you for a long time. I'm grateful to, to Jerry to paving the way. But again, as a matter of personal privilege, I some one of the things that often makes me despair about the, pers of the present political climate is that we so easily criticize, if not insult on a daily basis, those who have dedicated their lives to, to American public and political life. I am grateful to you, I'm very grateful to you as being the kind of public official, the kind of politician that encourages to, us to bring that word back as a compliment. I'm so grateful for the virtue that you manifest so lightly 
for your intelligence and your wisdom and your kindness to us tonight. So thank you. And please come back soon and often. Well, and thank you, Professor Flake. And, and you're right. The questions were amazing. They, these, the, your students and uh, those on this call are really digging deep in these, in these important topics. And that was very obvious to me. Well, it takes one to know one, as I said earlier. So thank you very much. And I wish you a good night to the rest of you. And we'll all run and check the, the count now. We can all go <laughs> see yeah. where the election stands. All right. Good night. Thanks, Professor Flake. Thanks, Dean Solomon and Jerry. And look forward to seeing you in Charlottesville when we safely can. Stay safe. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm. Great to be with you. Thank you.